Welcome to Brain Junk. I'm Amy Barton. And I'm Trace Kerr. And if I've learned nothing else on this podcast, it's that I can't research any topic without either stumbling across the 1933 Chicago World's Fair or spiders. I would concur with spiders. Yeah, because they're everywhere. I mean, mm-hmm. we keep talking about them. I can't get away from them. And as a recovering arachnophobe, I'm trying not to kill spiders. You know, I'm trying to face my fears, Mm -hmm. scoop them up in little cups and carry them out of the house and um, maybe screaming while I do it. What about (laughs) what about you? I I am normally very composed. Spiders aren't a phobic thing for me, but I if if they appear in my laundry suddenly because it's in the basement, I do wash a dead spider with the laundry. I'm it doesn't make it outside. You lost me at if they appear in my laundry. I can never go in your basement. (laughs) I am strictly an upstairs friend. I'm going to yep. be in the living room, possibly the kitchen. That's going to be it. Ugh. <laughs> Ugh. Ah. Okay. On this episode, we're going to face a whole bunch of our personal fears because today we're covering everything you never knew you wanted to know about phobias. There is a, a long, I'm sure you all know, there's a long history with phobias. Byzantine Emperor Heraclius had a phobia of bodies wa- bodies of water large enough to drown in. And the foundation for that was a prophecy about dying in a body of water. So there's that basis of it, that's a reasonable fear. People die in bodies of water all the time. And then when there's a prophecy associated with it, that just shoots it through the roof. And your brain flips a switch. In 440 BC, Hippocrates documented phobic behavior for the first time. In 50 AD, the Roman doctor Celsus coined the term phobia and defined the term for the fear of water as hydrophobia. Ah. So fun facts in history. I think I have some more here. I do like fun facts in history. Bring them on. Oh, I, I really enjoyed this one. Genghis Khan had a phobia. He had cynophobia, which is the fear of dogs. And when you think about the era of Genghis Khan, these are not house pets. And that is a very reasonable fear. But for such a warlike fellow who was purported to have been big and mighty to have a fear of dogs, apparently he took some flack for that. <laughs> Even though... Everybody else also was probably scared of dogs. For him to have that visible startle response, probably he got some ribbing. Winston Churchill was a glossophobic, so he had a fear of public speaking, which he clearly eventually overcame. Franklin Delano Roosevelt was a pyrophobic. Again, very reasonable on that one, because if you have, that was... A fear of fire? Yes, and that one escalated for him as he lost use of his legs, because for sure that would be a scary thing not to be able to flee from it. Hitler apparently was a dendrophobic, which is the fear of dentistry. Also, not my favorite thing. Here we go. Okay, so now I'm going to revise it. It's mm-hmm. I can't have a we can't have an episode without the World's Fair spiders or your dentist. I do. I, hey, Doctor Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Phobic behavior uh, didn't become a separate diagnostic category until 1947. So it's existed and been a part of society since 600 BC, but didn't get its own category until 1947. 1951, it was classified by the American Psychiatric Association. And now we've got all kinds of good information on it. My favorite and most interesting thing about subjects like this is the psychological. How does the brain work? Why can't you just reason yourself out of this? Yeah, what? just take a deep breath. It's just yeah. a spider. You're Chill fine. Out, dude. Yeah. No, it doesn't. There are many things about the brain that don't work that way, even though we have a conscious awareness of the thing being not functional in our life, but you can't just logic your way out of it. No. Read a great article by Leah Weinerman about figuring out phobia. And she talked about the science and what, what your brain is doing. What What is that reaction when you have that phobic moment? And scientists are finding that the amygdala is a big player in that. Oh, the panic button. Yes. And that relationship. So PET scans and MRIs are really aiding the checking it out. They did a lot of animal testing but you really can't ask an animal. So did you feel a logical fear because a snake can bite you or was it a startle reaction? You know, they they can infer many things, but they cannot. There's a certain point at which that is no longer useful. So they have moved into more testing with people, but these scans super helpful. New York University psychologist Joseph Ledoux There's two tracks when you have a fear response. And so what they were looking at was this immediate fear response that is that flight or fight or flight response versus the can your brain make a slow reasoned decision. 
those two responses are pretty normal for our bodies. It's like you set two turtles on the line and then you put a stimulus to your brain and those two turtles, one's going to go fast down the track and one is going to go slower. They're both started at the same time, but the fast one is going to have a sudden response to get you out of danger or to get your body reacting. It's not enough to analyze the stimulus. It's just quick get out of there. That's it's to that, save your life. Uh, like the, the YouTube videos where you'll see someone's planted like a fake snake or something. Yes. And and Clipped someone a fake spider and it, yeah, to and their it pants. just starts moving yes. and they freak and they're they've run quite a ways down the block before yeah. they stop and go, wait a minute. Yes, and that wait a minute is the second response. That's a more determined evaluation of an appropriate level of danger. And sometimes the reaction from there is continued freak out because, yes, it is a real threat. A real snake is coming for you or that is a shark. But many times it is that second response of calming down and maybe moving yourself out of traffic or taking a more appropriate measured response. And with people that have phobic responses and fear disorders, they did a lot of studying on many fear disorders. But with the phobic people, they found that that trigger for the sudden response, but kept looping back around. They couldn't get out of that quick response. That part of it kept pinging. So that that heebie-gajibies response that I have watching a spider walking, which is the creepy part for me is the movement. Oh, You know, my smart part of my brain is saying, it's just a spider. I'm just fine. It's not even walking towards me. The rest of me just keeps constantly, every time it moves, going, Ugh, yes. you know, and I don't, um, I'm not panicked. I'm not running around in tiny circles most of the time. What I don't like about a phobic response is that I am paying enough attention to feel almost embarrassed. Yes. Because you know it's not rational. I'm a grown up Mm -hmm. and I'm still freaking out. Yeah. And that's that faster, quick response. It's like a kid keeps grabbing the clothesline and pinging it. As soon as it calms (laughs) down, they grab it again. So now there's lots of different kinds of phobias. The one that I found the most interesting was phobophobia, which is oh yeah, absolutely no laughing matter. So phobias have a big spectrum. You can have uh, panic attacks and you can also just have a, well, I'm not really pleased with this, but mm-hmm. phobias are about anxiety. Mm-hmm. So anxious people, I am an anxious person, are more likely to have or develop a phobia and experience the sweaty symptoms of fear. You know, you're, yeah, you're nervous, you're worried. Yes. Well, phobophobia Phobia is worrying about the possibility of having the sensations of having a phobia. It's almost like you have a phobia of phobias. You're so consumed with worrying about, am I going to be afraid of this thing that you're creating that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That loop is starting. So would that person be triggered by observing someone else with a phobia then? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, it could come from anything. Huh. That would be more challenging because you can restrict your interaction with many phobias. Right. Well, like that um, one would be like someone who has a seraphobia. That's a fear of sourness. Oh, yeah. And like you were saying, oh, you'd never, ever be able to eat berries. No fruit desserts for you. Because you you could get something sour that could, you know, because they don't like that zingy feeling that you get Mm -hmm. from something sour, which is what I love about sourness. But that would be inconvenient. Yes, but avoidable almost completely. Yes, you could be like, okay, I'm just not going to eat that. And I'm just going to, you know, be careful before I take medications that I've never taken before and that kind of thing. But if your fear is of fear, you're kind of trapped. Yes, that would definitely be limiting. One study so fascinating by, I believe it's Arnie Ullman, a PhD in clinical neuroscience in Karolinska Institute of Sweden. And in 2004, he did a study where two groups, one was flashed pictures quickly within others. So that quick subconscious, you see it, but you don't consciously register. They would put in scary things and things that people could be phobic to. And they would measure the response. The things that would be a phobic response would trigger both tracks of that amygdala, that immediate fight or flight response, and the We need to determine if there's a real risk response. Even having it flash by that quickly. Too quickly for them to consciously be aware of. The fears in the the subconscious, it triggered both the immediate fight or flight and the slower decision making when they didn't, when it was quick and subconscious. When the pictures were flashed low enough for the subjects to register what it was, the fear response 
didn't. The phobic things did trigger that fast amygdala response, but not the fears. So if you're afraid of being hit by a truck, but you have a phobia of snakes, the picture of someone being hit by a truck would just be that slow decision making. It's not... Oh, that would be really bad. That's all your... Okay. But the brain did. The picture of the snake would trigger the phobic immediately, both roads down that quick response path. Wow. You know, what I found interesting was that the rate for different phobias uh, varies widely around the world. There isn't a lot of concrete data. I've stumbled across this one NIH study Mm -hmm. where they were saying, okay, we've extrapolated different data that we've got from all these different papers all over the world. And then there was a list of all these different countries. And it would say United States. And then there were percentage numbers. And then 10 million phobics in the U.S. Yes. And then, but in really big red letters, in all caps, it said, WARNING! And it was on every (laughs) single line for every single country. So you clicked on that and they said, okay, remember, these are just theoretical. These aren't real numbers. We're just extrapolating. Not really science going on here. So I didn't end up using that. But what I could find, adults in the United States, 11.5 million. Yeah. Or to put that in perspective, 1 in 23 people have a, what they call a specific phobia. Every classroom of kids probably yep. has a kid with a phobia. Yes. But <laughs> only 22% of those cases were considered severe. So most of us are... Odds are decent that you can be functional. Yeah. You know, we, we don't want to stand up in front of a group or we don't want to mm-hmm. handle the mouse. but And we're okay. We can be in the room, you know, and yeah. we can get through it. According to an article by the Washington Post, the top U.S. fears, public speaking. That makes sense. Number two, heights. And number three, kind of amorphous group of bugs, snakes, Mm -hmm. little crawly critters. Yeah. But what was funny is I looked at uh, several UK newspapers and magazines, and they had done surveys of their constituents. And their number one, instead of public speaking, was fear of heights. Really? For them, their number two was glossophobia, which is the fear of public speaking. The flip-flopped. Yeah. And public speaking was pretty consistently in the top five. Hmm. Oh, uh, Democrats are more likely to have a fear of clowns than Republicans. Really? Is that like <laughs> the um, murders and ice cream sales increase at a similar rate? Or is no. it really a correlation? Yes. They've found that... Oh, I don't know how I can get into this without offending a whole bunch of people. Okay. They've found that in this particular study that... Republicans on a whole Mm -hmm. are more likely to be religious. Okay. Okay. That jive. Well, if you're being religious, you have faith. And Mm -hmm. so you're you have this base within yourself of um, there's something bigger bigger than me that's taking care of things. Okay. And oftentimes Democrats are more liberal, they are less religious. And so yeah, this more self reliant kind of thing. There's not something out there that's looking after me. Sure. Democrats are found to be more anxious as a whole. That's interesting. And this higher level anxiety uh, is also that group that is more prone to have a phobia. That awareness of the fears of the world and yes, but without a mitigating factor. Bearing in mind these are like tiny statistical differences. Mm-hmm. I mean, all across the board. But fun. Yes, I know. And I was like, oh, well, and I'm not a huge fan of clowns, so... <laughs> Hmm, interesting. What okay. About, what about Christian Democrats? I'm cool with clowns. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have any trouble with that guy covered with makeup who I can't see his actual face. That doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> you did a poll. Yes. The poll was 50 50. Oh, are you kidding me? No. So I'm going to talk about both. There was no strong feeling about, you no. know, it was not like Doritos <gasps> versus Jello mold. No, initially, navels were in the lead. I did notice that. I think Navel's got a lot more comments. There were a lot of people that were like, Oh, my daughter's like, why did you put that belly button on there? That's weird. (laughs) It's dirty. (laughs) It's a half naked person on the, why? Like, well, you didn't like it. And she's like, fine, I'll go like it. (laughs) That's the only thing that's going to make me stop. my kid into liking my posts. (laughs) Yeah, Navel's did take a decided lead. And Beards, Mm -hmm. now I am married to a, a goateed man. Uh, I am also married to a bearded man. Yes. And uh, Chaz will do the... So in the spring, he's like uh, he's like a wild hare, except um, <laughs> instead of being brown in the spring and white in the winter, he has a goatee in these warmer months. And then as it gets colder, mm-hmm. his facial hair increases in mass, covering his entire face. 
It's like a built-in scarf. And um, <laughs> you do have people, the very strong reactions to facial hair. You do. It, it is noteworthy. It's actually quite interesting, too. The official name for the fear of beards is pogonophobia. And that pogon, uh, in my head, pogon doesn't sound right. Pogon means beard. That's all we have to say about that. That's it? No. <laughs> Check. Done. Yeah. In the 1920s, Dr. John Watson was able to condition the fear of beards into a young boy. And oh my God. I'm sorry. Yeah. That was in the battle days of mental health, friends. And so we're here to say he's just Yay! jumping out from behind a door. Ah, beard. It probably is. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. that, yeah. So the phobia information is the levels can vary, but it seems like there's an anxiety depending many people it's looking at it or the fear that it's going to touch them or they're going to have to touch it. Mm. And it can be make you nauseous. It can make you feel anxious and jittery. Okay, so let's just get, for the 12-year-old boys out there, let's get gross. If Chaz eats something yes. that's saucy, <laughs> yes. say barbecue, uh-huh. um, his beard will smell like barbecue for a while. Yeah. Like, I've smooched him the next day and been like, I know he has washed his face. Yeah. But he still kind of smells like barbecue. And mm-hmm. so, yeah, I know. I totally get how someone could be like, that's just, yeah. Yes. And that would be part of their phobia. The one thing I did read that was interesting about beards was that it's difficult to find good help for that. It's still a phobia. And you see bearded people unexpectedly all the time if you're out in public. But to find a good therapist that was willing to help work through that for one person's account was difficult. They're like, really? Oh. So even the professionals. And, you know, and mm-hmm. I, I got that impression, too, that for some of these, even someone who's working on mental health, you know, could be like, well, I'm sorry that you have a problem with shoelaces because when you were a child that this thing happened to yeah. you. But uh, what can we do? And the answer is the same thing that you do for the fear of spiders. But uh, that not being taken seriously would be wildly frustrating. Now, what about navels? Mm-hmm. You know, navels, they're kind of gross. I mean, they're down there. We don't they're wash germy. them very often. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're germy. Yeah. The fear of navels is called omphalophobia. And it's generally the fear of having your belly button touched or tugged on by yourself or others or seeing others touch their belly buttons. I read an account of <laughs> Trace just touched your belly button and I'm cool with it. <laughs> I was kind of hoping she'd scream. Yeah. Okay. No, I did read the account of a medical student who was struggling in medical school because almost immediately, belly buttons. You know, you get somebody standing up in front of a class. Like my husband has d- been the model for a class. And so they're like, can you take your shirt off, Mr. Barton? He's like, OK. And so they're like, here's the belly button. This is an innie and it's blah, blah. And they're showing. So immediately she's confronted with this problem. Oh, man. I never even thought about something mm-hmm. like that. So she could talk her way through it sometimes, but on a difficult day, she would feel very anxious and have to leave. And that would be super challenging. Can Mm -hmm. you imagine, you know, the patient comes in and (laughs) you've left for them on the table the fun gown that your butt falls out of in the back and a Band-Aid. Right. (laughs) And you're like, you need to put that on your navel. Bye-bye. I'm going to start dry heaving. Yeah. Because, Wow. One thing I did read is that hypnotherapy can be helpful for this and Mm. probably for many, many others, because I can see how that would be a helpful way for you to work around that amygdala response and retrain the brain. Yeah, I know I've found with the spider thing, just forcing myself to look at them, stay in the room with them, Mm -hmm. you know, not squish them on contact, but, (laughs) you know, try to calmly scoop said spider, you know, and take it outside. My turning point was I was driving on the freeway and I (gasps) had one drop down from the sun visor. And um, (laughs) it was not an insignificantly sized spider. Yeah. And it landed in my lap and I almost killed the whole family (laughs) because, you know, your instant reaction is let go of the wheel, slap at your body. And, you know, you can't. And, 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 you know, instantly I knew, whoa, no, can't be doing that. And so flicked it off my lap. Well, now it's on the floor between my feet. God knows where it could be going. It's for your pants leg, right? That's immediately what your brain knows. To yeah. Be true. And so when I made it to the rest area, driving much faster than I probably should have, <laughs> I was like, okay, I can't, we can't have that happen again. Did you, you know? demand a carcass for the bug before you would get back in? I did. Yes. I, I, I killed that spider before. Yeah. yeah we went on our way because whew, 
Yeah. A traumatic experience can often cause a phobia. For sure. Um, for me, I don't think that's why. It's just uh, they move creepy. But then yep. also realizing the traumatic experience on the other side can maybe motivate uh, you to yeah. try to face those fears. Well, okay, so we've talked about fear of heights and spiders and snakes and germs, and they're some of the most common, but we're going to try to dig a little deeper here. So I've got a quiz for you, Amy. (gasps) I love quizzes. We're going to uh, see if you can guess what these phobias are based on their name. No cheating. Don't look at my computer monitor. (laughs) I just leaned to the left. She totally was like, what? Okay. I'm just putting the lid on my drink. So first one, a blutophobia. A blutophobia. Mm. Uh, my daughter would be better at this than I am. A blutophobia. The blute part, I feel like it's the fear of those gross eggs. Gross eggs? Aren't they called blutes? There's some eggs that are like <laughs> fermented old ancient eggs. Oh, yeah. No, this you're is, going too far. So Your okay. face is saying no. That's no. not the right answer. A blutophobia like ablution for wash. So it's someone oh. who has a phobia of bathing or washing. Oh. Oh, there's a really interesting... I think every toddler on the planet has some (laughs) amount of a (laughs) blutophobia. Yeah. Okay. So let's see. How about chirophobia? Chirophobia. Like pyrophobia. If you're a fire, chiro. So I'm going to give you... So you got a chiropractor. Now they're working with bones, Mm. but they work with bones with their... So fear of... Your bones being cracked by people's hands, people having new Oh, tattoos. good guess as I point at my hand. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think, like, would it be the fear of anybody touching you and affect, like... No, it's fear of hands. Oh. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You hit the nail on the head. Oh, and then I went right past it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very rare. It, that And that could be your hands, which I think... Would that would be, be the most... Awful. Yes. I mean, that is a serious case of dysphoria, you know, that this yeah. thing that is attached to you is terrifying. I think I would wear a cone of shame all the time. Yeah. Or, so, <laughs> so that I wouldn't have to see, see it might be okay. <laughs> but then you have to smell your breath. Um, That's true, yeah. <laughs> okay, let's see. Uh, how about globophobia? Globophobia... Hemoglobin. Um, we could just go with regular old globe. Fear of maps? That doesn't seem right because mm, cartography no. would be more the word. I'm going to go with something with blood maybe. Okay. Well, globo, uh, if you think like a globe, you're yeah. kind of on the right track. It's a fear of balloons. Okay. And my mother-in-law has a serious case of globophobia. There are some people who are afraid of the anxious where you're waiting to see if it'll pop, you know, yes, like when the somebody's jack in the squeezing box effect. it. It's yeah. not that? Yeah. Or, yes, some people have that. And or some people don't like the way they look, the sound of them for her. Like, yeah, um, have you ever gotten a whole bunch of balloons with the helium and you're carrying them and they they kind of make that weird knocking sound against each other? Oh, sure. And then sometimes they also have that staticky crackle between them. Yes, that. She's like, No. Which I did not know. I once you got her a balloon. One balloon? She slammed the door practically in my face because <gasps> she was like, nope. Psh. Yeah, I don't want none of that. <gasps> okay, so now here's a, they're not fun. Well, okay, there is one that's kind of funny to me. The rest of them are not funny. This one. There's some that I find more relatable. They yeah. are, yeah. So lutrophobia, L-U-T-R-A. Fear of werewolves? No, it is the fear of otters. Oh, I love otters. I do too. But they are kind of angry, scratchy, well, dangerous and, in the right circumstances. So they're saying for most of these ones with animals like dogs, yeah. you were attacked by a dog at one time and you're afraid of dogs. Well, this lutrophobia, the guy was like, well, you know, people who have been attacked by otters are often afraid of them. And I'm reading this out loud and Zoe, my daughter, is like, <laughs> How Duh. often does that happen? It's not often in the news, you know, man attacked by otter. I was thinking <laughs> those three or four people that are like swimming through kelp beds here in the Northwest yeah. who bump into an otter. I don't know. I've worked mm-hmm. at the Seattle Aquarium and we worked with otters. <gasps> really? They're super cute. They're super friendly. Mm-hmm. You'd forget all the time that they were wild animals. You know, I've worked yes. in a zoo and in a zoo there's a big bear and it's easy to remember that that bear, mm-hmm. if you and he were alone... Otters are kind of the Eddie Haskell of animals, yeah, though. They're, they're so, so cute, cute, but they you might know? chew your arm off if they're hungry. Well, I don't know. And, you know, know, working with like Asian soft clawed otters, and they've got oh. these cute little feet and they chirp like birds, and oh. they're so cute. So, the, the lutrophobia, I was like, that's a sad fear. But mm-hmm. an avoidable one if you do not live here or go to zoos. There you go. Well, you can't or watch aquariums. Them. No nature shows. Oh, well. Not maybe. no nature shows, just judiciously chosen nature shows. <laughs> Only the ones in Africa. Do you have anything else? I have no listener mail. 
You have oh, no listener mail. No. Before we go, uh, I just have to tell you my my favorite phobia to say mm-hmm. is triskaidekaphobia. <gasps> <laughs> I do like that. Yes. I'd like to snack now. We just had Friday the 13th just the other yes. day. Well, Triskaidekaphobia, say it. You know you want to. I'll give you a second. Triskaidekaphobia. It is fun. Triskaidekaphobia. Mm-hmm. Triskaidekaphobia. Right? It's fear of the number 13. Which... There are many places that don't have a 13th floor, and I think that's a fairly per- pervasive cultural fear in certain places. Exactly. But for me, I just have to keep saying it. Oh, no. I'll save it In unison. Oh, we can save it to the end. Okay. Let's uh, hold on. We're hold, hold on. We're close out with Yeah. That. So please come visit us at brainjunkpodcast.com. We'll have some pictures and lots of notes for you because Amy's got a ton of history that you need to learn about. Uh, for this and other wonderful episodes, look for Brain Junk wherever you find your podcasts. We tweet at MyBrainJunk, and you can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Brain Junk Podcast. Trace and I will catch you next time when we share more of everything you never knew you wanted to know, and I guarantee you will not be bored. Triskaidekaphobia. I really like that. It is a good word. <laughs>